you uh, reside. Um, so if you please could, could write what country you do come from. You see there's many European countries and also uh, Africa, South Africa and India and also Australia and New Zealand. Great, thank you. There's still more answers coming in. Okay, I will end this poll and then we have another one just a sec. <coughs> um, here we ask you what you, uh, what is your main occupation or role? And as you can see, there's many clinical midwives and also midwifery students in different kinds of occupations as well. Thank you. I'll we'll just end this poll and leave. And then the last poll we will do just here to a start um, would be this one. Where we're asking you where you're from where you're joining from during this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will end the poll and then I will hand over the microphone to, to you, Sarah, again. Okay, so welcome to session 12. My name is Sarah Bansak and I'll be your facilitator for this presentation and the next one. And with me we also have Annette who we've just met. So um, Virtual International Day of the Midwife 2015 would like to wait, welcome the fabulous Sal Sally Prezaro. Um, Sally started her career with a degree in communications, media and popular culture and drama before studying midwifery with a master's in leadership for health and social care. She's been involved in healthcare and charitable services since 2004, and she's interested in the well-being of healthcare professionals, post-traumatic stress disorder, mental health and well-being, and has spoken at UK healthcare conferences about her experience and ideas for the improvement of healthcare services. And Sally is currently enjoying further PhD study in this area. Welcome, Sally. Hi, thank you very much for um, that introduction. I hope everybody can hear me. They should be able to. I see the green light is flashing, um, so that's a good thing. Um, thank you very much for inviting me today. Uh, it's very exciting to be here, and especially on a day where there may be a royal baby born that we are all discussing midwifery and other babies being born. Uh, but what I'm obviously pre predominantly interested in is when babies are born and when things happen in midwifery. Um, what happens to the midwife? Um, what happens to the clinical staff um, when we do the job that's needed? Um, okay, I'm trying to put the microphone closer to my face because you're saying I'm quiet. Is that better? Much better. Great. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, too close, right? Okay. Final adjustment good? Yup, okay, great. Then I shall continue if you are all sitting comfortably. 
So, my name's Sally Pizarro. I had that introduction there. I'm a PhD researcher at the Centre for Technology Enabled Health Research, and that's at Coventry University. And I'm passionate about the mental health and well-being for healthcare professionals, specifically midwifery. Um, I'll explain a bit more about my project and how it works and, and how you guys can hopefully become a part of it to help me. Um, what I'm trying to do is develop and evaluate an online intervention, so an online platform, uh, which is designed specifically to help midwives uh, and midwifery professionals um, who are experiencing psychological distress. I'm just at the beginning of this project at the moment, but I'm telling people about it because obviously I'm going to need lots of people on board to tell me what this thing should look like, how it could help, and what, what else should be included. Um, so I'm, I've got my supervisors ready, Dr. Wendy Klein, Dr. Andy Turner, Emmy Fulton are all helping me design this and, and get, make it evidence-based. And then I've also got Dr. Claire Gerarda and Elizabeth Bailey. Now, Claire Gerarda, I don't know if any of you know who she is, but she is um, immediate past chair of the UK um, College of GPs. Um, so she's very high up in, in the GP world and she's actually um, designed things um, like the practitioner health program which helps doctors in distress and GPs in distress, some with substance abuse disorders or just mental health issues in general. And there didn't seem to be anything um, equivalent for nurses or midwives. Now my background is midwifery um, and I definitely saw a gap for this so that is the reason I saw this opportunity to explore this area. And um, my blog is, is there and if you'd like to follow all the research and all of the stuff I do in this area if it interests you please follow that or follow me on Twitter. Uh, and hopefully you can sort of join me in this journey. So why is this project important? Well, a safe, high quality and cost effective healthcare is intimately linked to good staff health and well-being. Now, we all know that, don't we really? Um, whether there's enough emphasis placed on that is another matter. Um, and traumatic work environments in maternity services may be associated with stress, vicarious trauma and anxiety. So we know that um, maternity wards can be very busy, can be short staffed and very emotional in terms of the roller coaster we go through um, and how how kind of we, we cope with that on a daily basis. And currently there is a paucity of support for midwives who could be at an increased risk, risk of psychological distress due to the fact that they are independent practitioners wherever they work. Um, in a high area of litigation, maternity services generally um, accrue the highest litigation cost rates for whatever reason that might be. So that stress is constantly there for us. So what are we hearing from staff at the moment? Now this is other people's research I've drawn from rather than my own. Um, but you know, people are saying I suffer from a condition called being human. Now um, I think midwives can sometimes be put on a pedestal as in they're perfect, nothing ever goes wrong um, for them and you know they, they don't necessarily need the same help that patients do but they are human. And there's reports that say some of, some people are saying they're close to having a breakdown in mental health and just carrying on um, or looking to leave the profession. And a lot of people are saying I didn't come into the health service to be mediocre and fail. That's not why anyone joins the health service. It's not why anybody becomes a midwife. You do that because you want to make a difference and do a good job. It doesn't always work out the way you planned. And then this important quote here, blaming, scolding and punishment really have no place in the treatment of any illness. So when midwives are struggling, I think it's really important that we don't have punitive systems in place that stop other people coming forward and get help. So the current UK facts, this is just in the UK, poor mental health um, is equatable to a quarter of staff sickness absence. Now that's quite high uh, and it, it looks as though something should be really done to remedy that. And 38% of NHS staff have reported um, having have suffered at work-related stress and or been very unwell um, as a result of work-related stress. So we know it's affecting them um, and so inevitably they are going to need support for that. Um, unfortunately only 57% of NHS trusts have a policy in place to support that, support mental well-being of staff. So we've got the problem but perhaps not the support there. And 68% of staff report attending work at least once when they didn't feel well enough to do so. Now, as we know that staff well-being and health relates directly to patient care, if people are coming in when they shouldn't be, um, then that is going to affect our care, our level of care and our quality of care, unfortunately. 
So the midwife as the second victim, this is the concept of, of, of this term in particular. And Dr. Albert Wu coined this phrase. And I've been looking a lot of, about his work as I'm learning more about the subject. Uh, and basically, obviously, the, the patient is the first victim, whatever they're going through, however their um, needs are at that particular moment, um, they are a victim of um, something physically happening to them. But where the health professional is involved in, in an anticipated, unanticipated adverse event, they can come to become traumatized themselves. When that happens, they could then become the second victim of whatever trauma it was in the first place. And there's lots of um, reading you can be done around this. And I've left all these links and references on so that people coming back at a later date can just uh, have a look at those in detail. So what's the impact for the second victim? Well, they often become professionally insecure. Um, they don't have as much confidence, which we know we need in practice to advocate for women, um, challenge poor practice. Um, we can have changes in professional attitudes. So um, you no longer become kind of compassionate about the certain things you used to, or you, 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 know, you become angry or burnt out. Um, in, in that sense, it can affect you. Um, and then there's post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, these are really high up on the spectrum, and they really do need to be properly diagnosed by a psychiatrist or a mental health professional, which I am not. Um, but everyone thinks of post-traumatic stress disorder as, as just something that that kind of goes goes around whatever you know as a, as a word we throw about, but actually people can can suffer from just post traumatic stress. They're stressed by an event. It doesn't always go into a full blown disorder because um, there's certain criteria that would need to be met for that diagnosis. So we're looking at general stress symptoms, anger. They can have substance abuse disorders develop to cope with whatever's happening, um, and that can be a a symptom of the general distress. Um, Compassion fatigue, they literally burn out of things to give, even even though they want to care, and that's in their nature. They haven't got anything left in reserve to do that. So they become, perhaps have they, they have their sleep patterns um, altered, so they get tired and, and anxious. Um, that can have an effect on their family life, as, as well as depression. And all these things can impair their conduct. A lot of people forget the behavioral symptoms of mental ill health, health and just think it's all internal. But actually, they could become um, angry. They can do things they wouldn't normally do. Um, and there's those things that are really difficult to look out for. And they have increased risk of both personal and professional out adverse outcomes. So they could lose their job. They could be put on um, a period of leave. Um, and obviously, the, the worst of these um, impacts is death by suicide, which is rare, but it's on the rise. And recently, there was some data about some GPs that unfortunately took their lives while they were being investigated. Um, and no such data really exists for midwives. So hopefully, that's something I can address in my future, future path down this course. So what might be the cause of these um, horrible, horrible um, inflictions on, on midwives? Well, adverse patient in incidents, obviously. We've got never events, critical incidents, and we all know our, our obstet obstetric emergencies that can occur anytime, anywhere, uh, and they can go well, they can go bad, they can be managed well, they can live with you in terms of the memory of it for a long time. Um, medical error. When pe Nobody goes to work to make a medical error. They go to work to be good practitioners, but this happens. And when medical error happens, it brings about a whole lot of emotions, such as guilt, shame, lack of confidence again. And they actually um, need a lot of help and support to get through that. Um, whistleblowing is a big area of concern, where people are often victimized or isolated. If they whistleblow, it's a very kind of isolating, brave thing to do. Uh, and there are obviously problems in needing support to do that effectively. Workplace suspensions, you know, they're not supposed to be punitive when you are suspended. You are supposed to be taken safely away while some kind of investigation comes out or is investigated. But actually, you feel punished and punitive, you know, you feel punitive action against you because you can't speak to anyone. You're on your own and you don't know what's happening and you're not kept in the loop. People don't understand or necessarily prioritize your own emotional needs at that time. And that's the same with regulatory investigations. Um, the, re the research says that nurses and midwives are terrified of the NMC at times and, and don't want to self-refer and they're so scared of being reported um, for, for misconduct or ill health that they, they will often find that traumatic in itself if they do have to engage there.
Obviously, workplace bullying has come out within the Francis report and uh, Midstaffs and the Kirkup report um, as being a huge issue. And that could be as a result of other people being stressed in the workplace and taking it out on others, or you know the. The narratives there are endless, really. We could talk about that as a whole other, whole other um, presentation. And sometimes our patients are aggressive towards us and expect and demand more and more. Uh, and if we can't deliver that, or if we can't control that, or or give them the care that we want, that becomes um, a real traumatic experience for us. And the negative and traumatic organizational cultures as well, in terms of do you have empowerment at work? Do you feel that you can be promoted and be respected in your workplace? Um, do midwives feel they're being paid enough and valued enough? Well, we know that they are still fighting that cause as we speak. Um, so it's interesting to see how that could help their, boost their confidence. Are they suffering in silence? Now, I'm sorry there's so many words on this slide. I know that's very bad, but I just can't have all these things here so people could at least come back at a later date and have a proper read. But basically, Lots of lots and lots of midwives, lots and lots of healthcare professionals are in distress and relatively few seek help. They will often suffer their whole careers um, with secrets and facts that they hide in terms of feelings of shame, guilt, distress. Um, and it's ingrained in us that a person who shouldn't suffer is the patient. So the healthcare professional will always do whatever they can to make the patients not suffer. Um, patient comes first. That's all the way through midwifery training. The patient comes first. And when you have that, um, it means that sometimes you can forget about your own needs. And you don't want to admit that, that you're not um, coping or you're not doing very well or you're, you're suffering because you know you could lose your job, you could be suspended. Um, there's punitive systems that say, you know, if you've had too much time off sick, it becomes a disciplinary issue. Um, and also people judging, you know, whether you are capable enough to do your job if you are suffering in these conditions. Um, and, and that's something most people would like to avoid. Um, and because you are a health professional, you know exactly how to mask um, a, a sort of mental health problem because you've seen it in everybody else. And now you know the signs you would look out for. You can hide from your colleagues. And you might isolate yourself because you're feeling bad. So again, people can't see that you're in, in, in distress and struggling on your own. So barriers to seeking help, the words are very, very small, I apologize here, um, but we see the pressure from inside, don't show, um, and until breaking point comes really, so there's a lot of evidence to say that midwives will hold it in, hold it in, hold it in, and it will come out in some kind of big outburst at some point, whether that be anger or breakdown or um, those kind of things. And there's lack of service provision for places for midwives to go to seek help, especially if they feel that they can't go anonymously and their employer may find out, or um, if they're having severe problems with substance abuse disorder, that they know they might be referred to a regulatory body. So the stigma's there, and they often can't recognize their own mental health problem. It's difficult if you are ill to recognize that you are ill. Um, and there's limited finances to, provo to provide counseling or whatever it is people may need. Poor accessibility. And burnt out staff may have a distorted view of themselves. So um, if they feel that they aren't worth helping, they aren't worth um, looking after, then they may just go deeper into depression um, and not address their own needs and issues, which is really, really sad, um, as I'm sure we all love our colleagues. We we'll want them to go through that. So hopefully this PhD project can help. The title is The Development and Evaluation of an Online Intervention Designed to Support Midwifery Professionals Experiencing Psychological Distress. So every few seconds, someone in the UK will search the terms depression, stress, and anxiety into Google. Now that tells us that people are looking for information on this online. Um, that might be because they're suffering themselves and they're turning to an online platform to do that. They may want confidential support um, rather than go to their managers or go to someone else. They may want to just completely go under the radar and speak about it openly there. Um, the intervention I'm hoping to build can be tailor-made to suit the needs of the healthcare professional away from patient-centered services. You know, if you're suffering as a health professional, you may not want to go to the same surgery that you work in because you may see a patient and you're in distress and, and need to keep that professional boundary separate. And then hopefully this um, online platform can offer peer support um, midwife to midwife. So um, that, that can be quite therapeutic for people. We can also 
potentially in, add um, evidence-based therapies, story sharing, um, talking, and CBT therapies um, online are quite effective as well. Um, and if we can use the on online intervention to distribute support for those experiencing psychological distress, we can also hopefully promote help-seeking behaviours and disclosure through anim anonymity and amnesty. So a place of amnesty as well where you cannot be judged. I'm hoping we'll give people the confidence to seek the help outside that they do need, whether that's a GP or drug and alcohol services. So my project plan is basically at the moment I am doing literature reviewing. I'm telling people my plan to see if they think it's a good idea. Um, please tell me lots and lots of feedback. I need to know if this if this is something that you guys would find um, important. Um, I'm reading other literature, which tends to be, unfortunately, a lot of it's done in the States um, rather than on UK midwives. So clearly, I've got loads of work to do. Probably my lifetime won't be enough to, to do what needs to be done. Um, but looking into the literature, it's so clear um, that they are in distress. Uh, the numbers aren't clear at the moment, but they're there, and something needs to be done. We obviously have the Schwartz rounds. I don't know if any of you guys in the UK know about Schwartz rounds. Um, they're a kind of debriefing, talking service where people get together in the hospital and talk about the emotional side of their work. But as you can understand, not everybody may want to talk openly to their colleagues um, at that point in time. And so alternative, an alternative platform online could be the best place for those people who don't feel able to talk openly. So after I'm doing all my literature reviewing and telling you, you lovely people about this, I'm writing papers, hopefully, to get it out there as well. I need to work out, is this feasible? What do midwives need um, to do this and identify who, who needs this? And I think it's most midwives and midwifery professionals, to be honest. There's obviously ethical considerations to be explored if we're to do this. Um, and we have a ethical responsibility to tell um, to tell the NMC if somebody's unfit to practice, how can we do that um, when they actually need to speak openly um, about their problems? So again, the um, ability to be anonymous and have amnesty is, is a very ethical dilemma that I'll need to look at in more depth. So then my next step really is to do um, a Delphi study. Now a Delphi study is where I get a, a panel of experts, and you guys are all experts because you know what you need and you know what you want. Um, and I get a panel of experts and I get consensus on, on things that should or shouldn't be included in this intervention. So should it have online mindfulness? Should it have CBT online? Should it be anonymous? Should it be um, peer support based and people telling their stories openly and anonymously? And you guys can definitely help me with that if you'd like to become involved in that study. Then after I know from my Delphi study what people would want to see in this online intervention, I can start to build it. So that would be my kind of after the, you know after this summer really, I can start thinking about building and developing something. And then obviously we pilot test it. We ask midwives who want to use it, does it work? Can it help you? Um, and those kind of things in a quality quantitative way really in a research sense so we can publish papers about it and prove to people this is needed ongoing. Um, and if this tool proves to be effective in supporting, how can we take it forward? Would the, uh, would the uh, NMC take it on as an important way to take care of its staff? Would the NHS take it on? Um, NHS employers, we um, need to basically have it funded. So if this works, it will be it will be lobbying really to say, can we have the funding, please, to keep this moving forward? Because my PhD is only three years long, so I'm looking for people to get behind this. <laughs> so if it works, we can keep it funded um, by somebody going forward. And then you know, eventually, if it works, we can open it up potentially to nurses, doctors, and other professional groups. So thank you, everybody, for listening to that. And uh, if you do want to make this happen, I will be recruiting midwives, academics, yes, student midwives. I've just seen someone uh, asking about student midwives. Um, so I'll be recruiting all of those kinds of people to help me uh, sort of synthesize what should be in this platform, what you guys would need to make it useful to you. Um, and it, again, on my blog page, I will be announcing when I will be recruiting for that. And I think it will be this summer. And later on, when it's all built, hopefully I can keep in touch with you via my blog, via my Twitter, and get people together to test the intervention to see if it works properly or whether it needs, um, you know, tweaking here or there. Um, so 
that's how I want you to get involved, that's how I want you to share my research and get excited about this because I'm sure it has a place for midwives in distress and we need midwives to be healthy so that our patients can be healthy. It, it, you know, that's the whole title of my blog, healthy staff means healthy patients and that's what we're trying to get. Is it only in the UK? I've just seen. It will be initially um, because I first have to make sure it works. There's no point me spreading it across the world if it's rubbish. I need to make sure this is evidence-based and it works. If it works, then I can spread it out further in the UK and then if it works in the UK, other countries may well um, say, do you know what, this could work for us. Can we try the, doing this in Australia, doing this in New Zealand? And midwives are midwives all around the world and I'm sure they share the same issues and the same psychological distress in some form or another. So yes, there is the possibility that it could go everywhere but this is a small pilot study to say does this or doesn't it work and if it works I'm hoping there are no limits to where it can go. So um, I'm sorry to talk about lots of difficult issues um, and suicide and distress and those kind of things and uh, I understand that some of you guys may be um, struggling or in some kind of psychological distress in the workplace. So I do actually have um, a link for support, any support people may need, may need from having this uh, webinar discussion with me. Um, so please access that if you feel you've been affected at all. And I just saying about my presentation limitations, I said before, most of the studies unfortunately are based on American clinicians, American doctors, American midwives or nurse midwives as they're called there um, and I'm finding it hard to get the same kind of literature and, uh, and research that I need in the UK but as I said I'd like to build on that and like to keep in touch with all of you so that any studies in this area or in the future I can um, bring you with me and use your expertise in um, making things happen for the better. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. I think that's about it and I'd love feedback and questions if possible so you help me to learn about how this can help you and what else it might need um, right now as I'm building it and as I'm thinking about what, what it should contain. Um, it would be great to, to hear some of that. I'm just reading through what you're writing. Very important. Wish it was running now. Do you know what? I wish it was running now too, Linda. I actually spoke to NHS England and they were very keen to have this up and running as soon as, you know, as soon as we could get it. But it does take time to research things and make sure they're evidence-based. Effects of a midwife's own birthing experience as well. Yeah, I imagine that if this was built, lots of people would be wanting to talk about many different issues about their workplace, their own birth experiences and those kind of things. Uh, you can count on me to work in your room as well. This could be really useful for midwives working in conflict zones. My experience of working with midwives in Afghanistan shows the trauma really impacts on the midwifery practice. That's very true, but we also have to think about access. If you're somewhere where there's no Wi-Fi, no internet, how can, you know, if you can't use your mobile at work to get into the app, if you, you haven't got a computer at home, there are going to be barriers to this, unfortunately. And yes, there are a lot of hurting midwives. Emma, you love to be involved. Okay, link with me on Twitter, link with me on my blog, and I will make sure that you can have the opportunity to, to become a part of the study. Have you considered how to maintain confidentiality and privacy for patients when midwives share things such as adverse outcomes of birth? I have considered that. Um, I think it's going to need that anonymity um, clause uh, in it very, very strongly. Um, I also think it's going to need a large amount of midwives to dilute the data. Obviously, if I get a group of midwives from one labor ward talking about something, they're all going to know exactly who they're talking about, exactly about which patient, and that's not really going to work. And sometimes it is better to speak to a midwife, you know, hundreds of miles away to get a different perspective on what you've been through. Um, so that, uh, that's going to be key in doing that, and obviously not sharing hospital trust names patient names, all of those things that are in the NMC code of conduct anyway um, and the social media code of conduct that would need to be um, a part of, of, of that sort of the rules of the rules of use. 
hope that answers that question. But yes, ethically, there's lots to think about. That will be my next step. I, don't know. I think there are many survivor midwives. Yes, there are survivors. Not rather victims, but survivors. <laughs> Keep going through. Trauma in midwifery is common. However, as we midwives often expect the stiff upper lip, yes. I've witnessed this so many times and I'm glad that it's now being considered for a research and I hope for the support of midwives. Yeah, I know we have that a stiff upper lip culture. Perhaps that's British, perhaps that's just midwives, I don't know. But definitely, I think midwives are put up on a pedestal of being sort of angels of mercy, never do anything wrong. They are midwives. Oh my goodness, you know, you, you're looked at in such awe. Um, and it's seen as such a privileged job. It's almost, you know, how can I possibly complain? I've got the wonderful job of being a midwife. And uh, sometimes people can, you know, often feel like they can't complain, they can't whinge, they can't whine. Um, and they can't sort of say how they are stressed with it because you've got this wonderful job of being a midwife. Um, so you don't say anything, you carry on because the patient comes first. And sometimes we need to put ourselves first to care for ourselves so that we can make healthy patients. Got more questions coming in, I think, and more people joining in. I think this um, presentation is going to be obviously recorded. And I'll put it up on my blog, and I, I heard it was going on YouTube. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but if so, that's awesome, because we can um, refer back to this conversation and hopefully extend the conversation onto social media or on the blog, where we can, you know, if you guys have got any more ideas, you want to contact me, I'm very happy to sort of get your expert opinion on this. Trauma and delivery is common. Yeah. Okay, I'm just reading all of that. I don't know if there's any more coming in or whether you're whether you guys are done bored with me talking. <laughs> this kind of ties with self care that was discussed this morning. Yes, self care for midwives is so important. But do we do we give that um enough credit? Do we realise that's important when from student midwifery training we're told that the patient comes first at all costs? I think that's it. I think everybody's finished talking. There's 45 of you now who have enjoyed this, so I hope you've found this interesting and I hope, I hope I've inspired you to get on board with something like this because me hearing you say how important it is makes me feel like, yes, I really am doing something worthwhile. So thank you very much for being a part of this and I hope to see you in the stratosphere soon. Yes, actually, Maxine, very good point. Midwives who are hurting and then hurt those around them, cruel to women and to colleagues, etc. That's the um, sort of by byproduct of compassion fatigue. They cannot give any more, and it turns out actually is poor conduct sometimes. You know, speaking harshly to people, uh, losing that compassion, which hurts everybody, and it's just because they're hurting themselves and they need help. Um, rather than punishment, I think, actually. That's where the punitive doesn't come in. Someone who's behaving like that doesn't need to be um, necessarily disciplined. They need to be helped, is my personal view. Yes, OK. Yes, but bullying on other staff as well. Why are people bullying? Is it because they're nasty people? I don't think so. I think it's because sometimes they just feel so insecure and pressured themselves that if they remedied their own self, um, you know, self well-being and, and safe psychology, um, that it could be turned around. Okay, that's great. Oh, everyone's typing now. <laughs> okay, feel free to share it and show show it with your your colleagues and friends because uh, the more feedback I can get, the better, and it will definitely direct the the path of my research going forward.
Wonderful. Thank you, Sally. That was You're really welcome, good. thank you. That was a really good presentation. And I'm and I think you really hit a nerve with it as well. Um by the looks of the chat box. It's a, a much needed project. So um, we really appreciate your time, and uh, I think your passion for the subject is evident. So thank you so much. It's been lovely. Thank you for having me. Okay. I.